Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 74, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Any comments or questions or whatever can be sent to me, should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up a couple of times on the show, somewhere around there. And you can get the email address from there. I do answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it. But I do answer, I only ask that if you send me email, that you please include something like um, your cable show or left side of the aisle or whatever in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. Uh, Okay, with those by now standardized introductions out of the way, let me get to it. Um, We're actually going to start right off the top with our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. A little while back, a California woman named Angela Yartz wrote a check to Walmart for $47.95. She found out later the check had bounced. She found out because she got a letter signed by the district attorney of Alameda County, California, threatening her with a year in prison if she didn't pay up, plus penalties, plus fork over an additional $180 for some financial accountability class. A total of $280. Now, here's the thing. There was no actual charge against uh, Ms. Yartz. There wasn't even an actual legal investigation of Ms. Yartz. The letter didn't even actually come from the DA's office. It came from a collection agency that was being allowed to use the DA's official stationery in order to send a threatening letter. This is going on in about 300 prosecutor's offices around the country. 300 prosecutor's offices around the country are allowing their official stationery to be used by a private corporation uh, to make false threats about non-existent legal investigations in order to intimidate the targets of those companies. Now, what makes this worse, if it can be worse, is that the DA's offices in these cases are either paid for this or they receive a portion of the fees that are collected. Now, how that's not at least malfeasance, if not an outright kickback scheme, I frankly don't get, but that's what's going on. Debt collection is a $12 billion a year business in this country. Some 30 million people are now in the sights of debt collectors, a number that has obviously gone up as the economy has gone down. Debt collectors frequently turn to strong-arm tactics and threats, uh, often enough illegal threats, such as, well, let's put it this way. Last year, the FTC got just under 181,000 complaints about debt collectors. And now, district attorneys around the country are enabling, in fact, becoming partners in the bogus threats and crude intimidation Uh, including making quite probably illegal demands to pay for this financial accountability class as part of a settlement. Hey, what do you know? The state is acting in cooperation with corporations to go after single private individuals who are struggling to pay their bills. Gee, what a shock. And the outrage of the week. All right, I've got a couple of things where I've got uh, some updates on things that I've talked about before. And a little yin-yang here for you. I've got one bit of good news and two bits of bad news. Uh, When I can, I like to start with good news, so I'll do that here. I've been talking, it seems, forever. In fact, it's been well over a year about these uh, attempts by the right wing to restrict the franchise. That is to make it hard for certain people to vote. Those people being almost exclusively people that are more likely to vote for liberals than than conservatives. As part of that, I mentioned the uh, voter ID law in Pennsylvania. This is one that threatened to block tens of thousands, even potentially hundreds of thousands of registered voters from being able to vote because they didn't have the right kind of photo ID. The lowest challenge in a suit as part of which the plaintiffs, which are, you know, those are the people who file the suit, uh, the plaintiffs asked for a temporary injunction to block the law while the case proceeded. 
A few weeks ago, I told you about a Commonwealth Court Judge Robert Simpson denied that motion, allowing the law to go into effect. I said at the time that the idea that the state Supreme Court would reverse that ruling, the chances that were regarded as quite slim. The good news is I was wrong. Uh, on September 18th, in a 4-2 to two decision, the court vacated Simpson's ruling and returned the case to the lower court for reconsideration. Importantly now, the majority sent the case back with instructions that almost require Simpson to issue the injunction. Uh, in fact, the court called such an injunction the most judicious remedy. In fact, Simpson was instructed, I'm quoting, to consider whether the procedures used for the deployment of the ID cards to residents who don't have them, uh, whether those procedures are in accord with the law, which the court made clear they're not. Significantly, the court stated, again quoting, we are not satisfied with a mere predictive judgment based primarily on the assurances of government officials that no one will be disenfranchised by the law. Simpson has until October 2nd issue his new ruling. But here's the really good news, underlying the good news. The two dissenters did not refuse to join the majority because they agreed with Simpson's original ruling. They refused to join the majority because they said the Supreme Court should have issued the stay itself instead of just sending it back to the lower court. Uh, frankly, I think it looks like the Pennsylvania photo voter ID law is toast. And that is very good news. All right, well, this is a week of one step forward, two steps back. I've got two other bits of updates, um, both of them bad news. Um, taking the older one first, the way has been cleared for Arizona's notorious race-baiting, xenophobic, anti-immigrant papers please law to go into effect. Now, much of that law was struck down by the Supreme Court in June, which argued that uh, states have to defer to the federal government on immigration issues. But the most contentious part of the law remained. This is a part that requires police to inquire about the immigration status of anyone they stop who they reasonably suspect is in the country illegally. Gee, I wonder to what sort of people this is going to happen. An emergency appeal was filed in federal court, arguing that the practice will inevitably lead to racial profiling and unjustifiably long detentions of Latinos. The appeal was rejected this week, allowing police to begin enforcing this law under which any combination of brown skin and accented, or worse yet, no English, will become a cause to be detained. Five states, Alabama, Georgia, Indiana, South Carolina, and Utah, have adopted laws based on Arizona's. And one other thing now, um, and this is something that actually should concern all of us no matter where we live. Back around the beginning of the year, I told you about the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, I, said, I warned you about this because it includes a provision that allows the government to imprison people definitely without trial or even charge based solely on the president's decision that you are a suspected terrorist or part of an associated force, whatever that means. This would even include U.S. citizens detained on U.S. soil. Now, some of what I'm going to tell you I've told you before, but it's the lead-in to the latest news. On May 16th, uh, federal judge Catherine Forrest found the law's unconstitutional violation of due process and free speech. She did so after a rather Kafkaesque hearing in which the government could not even define, in fact, failed to define terms in the law like, like um, substantial support and associated forces. Instead, the government tried to argue that the plaintiffs um, could not, did not have standing to sue because, uh, which means that the law had not applied to them. That, that is, they hadn't been indefinitely detained. So the government was arguing, in essence, that the only people who have the right to challenge this law are people who are beyond the reach of the courts. Last month, in August, the feds are back in court appealing Judge Forrest's decision. Now, hilariously, um, despite the failure to be able to define basic terms of the law, the government's appeal insisted that it's not vague. Um, but here's something. Here's, 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 the, here's the, th the key here. The appeal, the government appeal, argues that the plaintiffs 
which include a Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, several academics, and actually a member of the Icelandic parliament. Uh, quoting the appeal, cannot point to a single example of the military's detaining anyone for engaging in conduct even remotely similar to the type of expressive activities they allege could lead to detention. Fine, then just say that. Say those sorts of activities are not covered by the law. Say there's no problem. Say that's not what the law means. Just say that. But the fact is, they won't. They want this law broad. They want it vague. They want it to use as broad a brush as possible. They want this law in place, in force, and they want it in force with no legal or constitutional restrictions as to its reach. This week, they got a step toward achieving that goal. A federal appears, appeals judge issued a temporary stay of Judge Forrest's ruling, leaving the Obama administration free to enforce the indefinite detention policy. Now, our president, Hopi Changi, issued a statement when he signed the NDAA that said he wouldn't use the power of indefinite detention without trial, and he later issued regulations to that effect. Well, that's all well and good. The thing to remember, though, is that that, in essence, is a promise. It's a promise that could be reversed at any time. It's a regulation that could be, uh, d uh, that could be uh, revoked at any time. And even if you grant him the best of intentions, saying, oh, Barack Obama would never use this power, this, this regulation, this promise is not binding on any future president. And despite his waiving the authority under the law, his Justice Department has aggressively defended it in court. I'll say it again. They want this law. They want it in force. And they want it to be as broad as possible. When I talked about this last month, a month ago, I raised the possibility of that we are becoming what I call a soft police state. This is one where the outward trappings of democracy, like elections and free speech, go on. But they continue only because and only to the extent that they do not threaten the positions and perks of the powerful. Because frankly, it's hard to imagine how, how any truly free nation, how any truly free people, how any free nation is supposed to look at a law that gives a president, any president, the right essentially to imprison anyone they want for as long as they want without trial or even charge based on activities that can't be specified and terminology that can't be defined with the only protection here being the hope that this power given will never, ever, ever be abused, how any free people is supposed to look at that and not see a dark cloud over their freedom, I can't imagine. If you're not, you know, the thing is, if you're not any kind of troublemaker, you don't have to worry about any of this. But the fact is, if you're never any kind of troublemaker, you don't need freedom. And we're going to take a break. Here we are. We're back. Uh, we're actually going to come back with uh, our occasional feature. It's called Everything You Need to Know. This is where you can learn an awful lot about something uh, in just a couple of sentences, sometimes a sentence, sometimes just a phrase. Well, in this case, uh, it uh, brings up former presidential candidate and former United States Senator Rick, I should be in a sanitarium. He was recently speaking, on, sep on September 15th, he was speaking to the grossly misnamed Values Voters Summit, and he said this, and I'm quoting, We will never have the media on our side ever in this country. We will never have the elite smart people on our side because they believe they should have the power to tell you what to do. Yeah, those people want to tell you what to do, unlike, say, United States senators passing laws. Uh, but the real point here, the real thing here, is that there it is, laid out for all to hear. The right-winger talking to his fellow right-wingers saying, smart people will never be on our side. That is everything you need to know. All right, going from the lighthearted to the deadly serious, I have to talk some about the protests that are raging across the Muslim world over this film that... Um, I think it's called In The Innocence of Muslims, I think it's called. Now, right at the top, I have to tell you that this film, it's available on YouTube. The trailer for it is available on YouTube. I tried to watch the trailer, and I could only get through, like, the first three or four minutes. 
for I just couldn't. This is without doubt one of the worst movies of all time. It is in. It is incredibly awful. I mean, by comparison, Robot Monster. Look it up. By comparison, Robot Monster is a masterpiece compared to this. If it wasn't for the deeply, deliberately offensive nature of the film and the fact that the producers of this movie hoped to create the violence and bloodshed that it has created, this thing would be utterly hilarious. And it needs to be said, too, that by any rational standards, it is utter madness to get that angry, to get that upset, to get that violent over something as incredibly stupid as this movie. But reality is what reality is. And the movie is consciously and deliberately offensive, and it has sparked violence, along with a large number of noisy but otherwise peaceful demonstrations around the Muslim world. Now, I'm not going to try to cover events in detail. Rather, I want to make a couple of points on a couple of points. Now, first, you you may have already heard about this, but it, it does bear repeating just in case. Indications now are that the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi in Libya, this is the one where the U.S. ambassador was killed, uh, that this attack had nothing to do with the film. It was a pre-planned assault, carefully planned, carefully staged, which apparently used the film as kind of like an excuse, something to hang it on, if you will. But that in turn actually raises the question of how much of the protests were not not pre-planned, but rather... Rather that there are people who uh, look to promote violence. I'm talking about radical Muslims here who, are look, who, who look for things, who search out things. I mean, we know that some of these imams search through the Internet looking for things to be offended by. And I wonder how many of them actually look for an excuse to try to rouse that anger, to try to touch the, 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 the suspicion and resentment that many in the Arab and Muslim world still feel towards the West. And by the way, you do know that Arab and Muslim are not synonymous. Okay? In fact, the, by population, the largest majority Muslim nation in the world is Indonesia. But um, the point is, are, are they still trying to touch that, that suspicion and resentment uh, in order to advance their own power? in order to establish their own power base. Even, but still, at the same time, we have to keep in mind that it's only been a very small minority of Muslims who have taken to the street and even a smaller minority of those who are trying to exploit this for their own ends. Related to this, however, there's an important thing. Uh, Cenk Uger of the Young Turks made what I think is a very good point. He said he suspects that a lot of the people in the Muslim world don't actually understand how the U.S. works. Uh, that they think, based on their own experiences, that if a film like this was produced in and openly shown in the United States, which it apparently was once to about 10 people, but if it was openly produced and shown in the U.S., it had to have been done with the approval, if not the active support, of the U.S. government. Because they themselves have had very little experience of free speech, they don't they fall short in understanding what that means here uh, about what restrictions actually do still exist on the government. They blame the U.S. as a whole uh, for what a literally tiny handful of bigots did. Now, final point here, final point here goes back to what I said about an undercurrent of suspicion and resentment. Joe Scarborough at MSNBC uh, dismissed the protests about the film, uh, dismissed any other cause than they hate us. And then went on to say that scratch any one of them from a peasant up to a prime minister and you'll find somebody who'd be happy to have the chance to throw a rock at a U.S. embassy. Apparently not getting the irony that by that bigoted statement he's just given them another reason to hate us. But what I want to do here is I want to take a couple of moments. I want to read you something that I wrote. Uh, It's an edited version of what I wrote on October 2nd, 2001. This is uh, less than a month after 9-11. And it was a response to the question flying around, why did they hate us? So I'm quoting now. For a moment, just for a moment, try to see the world through the eyes of an average person on the ground in the Middle East. This is how the world might look to you. For centuries, the West has looked down on you regarding you, your culture, and if non-Christian, your religion as inferior. 
There is a reason that bin Laden keeps referring to American crusaders. They think of you as ragheads or towel heads. Every time a strong Arab leader rises up and tries to become independent of the West, they get slapped down. The only regimes that survive are those that are too weak or too corrupt to threaten Western interest. One such threatening government was that of Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran, who was overthrown in a CIA-engineered coup in 1953 because he attempted to nationalize oil reserves. The result was the 26-year reign of the Shah of Iran, whose army was practically stamped, made in the USA. Yes, you resent the West's wealth, but it's not so much that they're rich and you're poor. It's that, that they're rich because you're poor, that their wealth is built on exploitation and economic domination. Uh, in just the past 20 plus years, and remember this is written in 2001, in just the past 20 plus years, you've seen the U.S. pick a fight with Libya and the Gulf of Sidra, bomb Tripoli, openly try to kill Muammar Gaddafi, bomb a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan on the spurious claim that it was a chemical weapons factory, leading to thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of deaths due to inadequate supplies of medicines. Stand by along with the rest while Muslims were slaughtered in Bosnia, stepping in only when European interests are threatened. Shell Beirut, shoot down a civilian Iranian airliner, and fire cruise missiles into Afghanistan. And then there's Iraq, its infrastructure systematically destroyed in a war which it seems to you had nothing to do with the West except to humiliate another strong Arab leader. In the run-up to that war, you saw foreign troops stationed near the holy sites of Islam at the insistence of the U.S., despite Saudi Arabia's reluctance and their warnings that this would be deeply offensive to conservative Muslims, which it was, one so being offended, being Osama bin Laden. For 10 years, you've seen the bombing of Iraq continue, so much so that a few months ago, a Pentagon press representative referred to one such bombing raid as routine. Sanctions imposed by the West have cost the lives of over 500,000 Iraqi children over the past 10 years, a death toll which then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright described in 1996 as worth it. Worth it, yes, you say, as long as it's Arab children who are doing the dying. And you see the U.S. justify both the bombing and the sanctions on the grounds that Iraq defies U.N. resolutions, while at the same time it pours billions of dollars in economic and military aid into Israel, despite the fact that for 30 years Israel has openly defied U.N. resolutions with regard to the Palestinians and the occupied territories. It's not even so much that the U.S. supports Israel, it's that it does it to the detriment, the denigration, the denial of the Palestinians. If that was your world, what would the West, what would the U.S. look like to you? Like a noble friend or like a conceited, arrogant, selfish bully which figures it can do as it damn well pleases without cost to itself? Seen through such eyes, the question, why do they hate us, answers itself. Now that's what I wrote then, in 2001. In the intervening years, what have we seen? We've seen the Afghanistan war, we've seen the Iraq war, we've seen the drone war on Pakistan, the drone attacks in Somalia, the drone attacks in Yemen. Still no justice for the Palestinians, still no settlement, still no peace. I want you to ask yourself if in those past 10 years we have really given anyone, any Arab, any Muslim, any reason to change their minds. All right. I'm going to move on from there to our very last thing. Um, the other ongoing news thread of the week is the Romney video. This is the one, you know, this is where he was at a $50,000 a plate fundraiser and said that the 47% uh, of Americans who don't pay federal income taxes believe they are victims, he said. He also said they're dependent on government and believe the government has a responsibility to care for them. They believe they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it, and the government should give it to them. He also said he wouldn't worry about them because, quoting, I'll never convince them they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. In other words, if you don't pay federal income tax, you're a lazy bum and a moocher. Now, lots of people, including some on the right, have pointed out how insulting those remarks are and how incredibly wrong they are. Uh, he was right that nearly half of, of Americans pay no federal income tax, but he was wrong about just everything else. First and most obviously, not paying federal income tax doesn't mean you don't pay taxes. There are payroll taxes, for example. There are state and sometimes local income taxes. There are sales taxes, property taxes, excise taxes. Um, only 18% of Americans actually paid neither federal income tax nor federal payroll tax. They are mostly low-income seniors on Social Security and the very poor, and they are subject to some of these other taxes. 
In fact, bring up that tax chart. Bring up, I'm going to show you this chart. This chart looks at all taxes, okay, not just, not just federal income taxes. First thing to notice is that even people in the lowest income bracket, the poorest 20%, surviving on an average wage of $13,000 a year, pay taxes. Note, too, is that as your income level rises, the amount, of, the amount of your income that goes to federal income tax goes up, but the amount that goes to state and local taxes goes down. But here's the thing I wanted to point out about this chart. The two columns that are marked shares of total income versus shares of total taxes. For each income group, notice for each income group, the numbers are basically the same. We're supposed to have a graduated tax system, a system where the, um, your burden grows as your ability to bear that burden grows. But we don't. We have, in essence, a flat tax system. All right, get rid of that because I've got one more thing to say. And this is the important thing because this is the thing you're not going to hear most other places, even on the liberal talk shows. Romney said the people who pay no federal income tax believe they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. Yes, they are. We all are. We are all of us, simply by virtue of being human beings, we are entitled to a basic and adequate level of, uh, of food, of clothing, of shelter, of health care. Uh, one of the purposes of government, of society, is to see to the needs of those who need that help. This is not just a philosophical point, by the way, it's a legal one. The UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which the United States is an original signatory, section Article 25 says, quote, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood and circumstances beyond his control. Yes, they are entitled. And for those of you who consider yourselves Christian, remember Matthew 25, verses 41 to 45, talking about the last judgment, when God will say to those on his left, depart from me, you are accursed. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And by the way, don't forget Matthew, 20, Matthew 19, 24. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. But that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. You have the best week you possibly can, and uh, we will see you next week, hopefully with better news.